just going to keep this rolling. We're having so much fun and progress here today with the Sure Initiative. It's a delight to introduce two folks in Canada, very active in university real estate and student accommodation, perhaps uh, the best first in Canada combined, the best minds in Canada combined. Uh, Dr. Jeff Payne, President and Vice Chancellor, University of Northern British Columbia, and uh, Dr. Mike Port, Vice President, International Services at the Scion Group Advisory Services. So again, Jeffrey Payne, University of Northern British Columbia, and Mike Port, Scion Group, to talk about bridging education gaps with Indigenous communities. How are universities engaging with this important population? We're having to make this a conversational session um, with some good insight and good uh, suggestions as well. Please welcome the two doctors, Mike and Jeffrey. Thanks uh, very, very much, Brian, uh, for the introduction and, and the opportunity to, to be uh, a part of this conference uh, and really the opportunity to have what I feel and Mike feels is a very important conversation in supporting Indigenous students uh, on our campuses. I'd like to first start by acknowledging that we are uh, here today uh, on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. So I want to start with that. Uh, we will encourage audience participation as part of our uh, presentation this afternoon. Uh, what we'll do is I'll, I'll say a couple of remarks and then I'll turn it over to, to Mike. And, and we really do want you to ask questions. Uh, we know we're, we're in the lunch and everybody's grabbing some food and everything like that. Um, so as the title of, of the session is, and, and as Brian says, um, and so just to orientate folks where I am. So uh, I'm the UMBC has four campuses uh, in Prince George, Quinnell, Fort St. John and Terrace. Uh, with the larger of the four campuses being in Prince George. And there's a, a picture of our, our campus at, at night there, a beautiful campus. Uh, I've been at the university now almost 19 years uh, and I've been in the president's seat. Uh, I came on just before COVID, literally 19 days before COVID hit. Uh, so what a way to start life as a president. Um, but in terms of this, this topic itself, it's really important as a bridging education gaps with indigenous communities and how universities are engaging in this, with this important population. And so I'm just gonna make a couple of, of comments uh, and carry key areas of focus and how, um, how UMBC is, is working and navigating through this uh, and uh, to sort of set the context at least through the lens of, of myself uh, at, uh, at UMBC. I would say our, our approach to supporting Indigenous students is, is continued and will be aspirational. The work is never done. Uh, and so we, we always have to keep striving to improve, listen, learn, and, and make sure that uh, those students that come to UMBC uh, from, from our not only the Indigenous and First Nation communities in Northern British Columbia, but from all over, um, are well supported uh, while engaging with us on their academic uh, and learning journey. We work with close to 20 First Nations communities throughout the North, and, and that number of then students coming to UMBC continues to grow. Uh, within our housing itself specifically, um, we are uh, what I would say a typical undergrad housing structure, a quad structure, so a room in the middle and then four rooms that kind of go off that, 550 beds. And uh, of those 550 beds or individuals on, within our housing, uh, about 1.5% are, are Indigenous students. And so, but that number continues to grow. We have many uh, relationships, as I said, with, with those communities that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and they, uh, in terms of wanting to ensure that uh, st you know potential students then then students are, have the opportunity to come to UMBC. The other thing I will say is because we have so many communities, we need multiple approaches and how we support housing needs for those students. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, but w we just can't assume that you know you work with one First Nations community and the approach we would take in supporting students fits all. So we need to be flexible and adaptable to the student needs. And one thing that I've learned and, and working with the team 
is our ears always are wide open as we are listening to our students and, and learning from them and how we can do a better job. At UMBC, we have sort of four main approaches that we've been working on to support uh, our students. Uh, first, we have a very robust First Nations Center that supports the students. We are moving towards our first ever Associate Vice President Indigenous, uh, we'll, which will continue to support high level strategy, policy, and support my office. Uh, we have, um, uh, we're creating a new center for Indigenous Studies, elevating our First Nations Studies Department which will then support students in their academics and research. And then we are also working with our communities through uh, education uh, advisory panels. And, but it, going back into housing in terms of how we support students, we don't have dedicated uh, beds for Indigenous students. What we do though, we do prioritize uh, Indigenous students when they are applying to, to housing at UMBC. And the reason for that, as I said, our, our our structure in terms of a quad structure, very undergrad style, and we are working towards developing new housing, which is why this, impor this is an important conference for us to be at. Um, but that, that allows us flexibility. So if, there's, if, if it was just indigenous housing, then we wouldn't be able to be flexible and fill it if there, if there were needs there. So we, we do have a prioritization, but we don't have, as say, a dedicated bed. The most important thing though that I wanna talk about in, in sort of my, my opening remarks and this is the third bullet there. We need to ensure housing is a home. We talk a lot about the built structure and uh, we'll talk some more about that on this panel as we've heard throughout the day. But what's important or even more important is that, that housing is a home. And students for at least at UMBC are coming from very small communities and we need to ensure that it's safe and inclusive. So some of the things that we've done at UMBC to, to ensure that the, their housing, their bed, their room uh, is more than just a, uh, a place to, uh, to sort of uh, lay their head when they're coming to class or coming to UMBC, I should say, is, um, is make it a home. So our residents are very close to our campus, less than a two minute walk. Uh, might be a little quicker in the winter because you walk a little quicker. It does get quite cold in Prince George. We did have minus 45 this year, so you can move much rapidly across, but it's only two minutes. But within that two minutes, and once you enter main campus, um, you have access to our First Nations Center, you have access to our cafeteria, which is quite close, as well as the library. So that access is really important. The other thing we do is we have an Indigenous residence advisor living within our housing to support our Indigenous students. And that's really important to, as I said, to ensure a safe and inclusive environment. We're also working on new approaches in terms of restorative justice uh, to ensure that if any issues do arise with all of our students, but you know our Indigenous students here, that's as a way to deal with that. The other thing that we've done in terms of, uh, of making it home, as I said, many of these students are coming from small communities. The executive chef at, at, uh, at the campus in, uh, in Prince George for our cafeteria and for all of our, our food is indigenous. Um, and uh, it's from Stilatin, which is about 160 kilometers uh, away from Prince George. But having somebody that sort of is, is indigenous and, and trained in, in, in indigenous food or, or has grown up with indigenous food for that matter uh, is really important and uh, I will say uh, does make the best bannock that one would ever find in our indigenous students uh, do like that. The other thing I'll say is in, in, in terms of having our ears wide open, I said, you know, hear and listen, uh, we do run surveys, focus groups with our indigenous students and I will say uh, the student satisfaction for our, uh, our uh, for our Indigenous students is extremely high. That doesn't mean that we can't improve, but we're really making sure that we're listening to their needs and, and going forward. The housing needs to be integrated, as I said, into university support systems, and whether that's through restorative justice in our housing and residents, but also uh, ensuring that into the into the university structure itself. And that gets back to, as I said, you know, number three, which is ensuring it's a home. And as I say, students are coming from small communities. As we move going forward, we're looking at having elders and residents. Um, we're looking at having more ceremonial space within our residents. And we're looking at ensuring that uh, 
the access to all things that the Indigenous students do want and do need to feel safe and, in, and inclusive as part of the UMBC community is being met. As I said, the work that we're doing is, is never done. It's very aspirational. Uh, and, uh, but I, I do think that we are, we're making some positive strides and, uh, and I'm looking forward to as we continue to, to, to move along in this area. As I said from the outset, we will have the audience participation section, so we do want you to ask questions, but I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna hand it over to Mike, thanks. Now it's your slide, there you go. Hey, hi everybody. Um, my name is Mike Port, I'm the Vice President with the Scion Group. Um, and uh, to address one thing, um, I am a about as stereotypical a white male Canadian as you can get. My family's been in Canada since before it was, it was officially called Canada. Um, but coming, uh, the way I got into this being such a, uh, a focus area of my work, um, started with the, the ability of having a lot of family that lived in the North and having family that were connected to Indigenous groups and Indigenous friends and being able to meet people. But the real thing it kicked off was when, and that's what that picture is, when I became the Director of Housing at Trent University. Uh, that is the First People's House of Learning, um, also known as Zosky College for the residence area. Um, but being able to be a part of the planning uh, process with with all the Indigenous elders and the Indigenous faculty, um, it is the first PhD program in Indigenous Studies in Canada. Um, that opened my eyes to a whole number of things that I had never considered before. Um, and recognizing what I don't know and that I need to know more, um, being able to work with a lot of students at Trent and a lot of faculty and staff at Trent, um, where this was this issue is a priority, uh, that is what kicked off a lot of these things. And then through my work at, at Scion, this has become something that has been um, becoming a, a very big part of my work in general, because with just about every college and university, there are issues that are really specific to Indigenous students. Um, and some of those issues are in general and go countrywide, but they are also very specific to the campuses and the areas in which those campuses are, are found. Um, and we've done a lot of work in Canada's north, where that is a, as a big an impact. Um, University College of the North, University of Saskatchewan, some other universities in Saskatchewan where there's significant Indigenous populations. Pretty much every school north of Sudbury in Ontario has more significant Indigenous populations in addition to Trent. Um, in BC, we've worked with a number of the colleges on the island as well as up north that again have very specific Indigenous student populations, different bands and tribes that are working and nations that are working with those campuses and that they serve that are very different. So you can come into it with the general idea of you know, we need to bring this Indigenous knowledge to the campus and these supports that work best. But then you've also got to take some really specific time, as Jeff said, about listening and hearing about the specific cultural needs that that particular place is dealing with and where those students are coming from. And that might be dozens, um, especially when you get into the North. Some of the distances that these students are coming from can be in the several hundreds to a thousand kilometers away. And they're coming from very disparate communities uh, with very different experiences and often very little money. Um, and trying to make that sense of home for them amongst everyone else uh, is not simple, but it's worth the effort. Um, some of those things um, that have come up a lot is there's, in general, there's often two populations. There's the single relatively traditional aged indigenous student that's coming to your campus and there are housing needs that, that fit with that. But then within the indigenous community, the, in terms of the student populations, they are absolutely disproportionately single moms. And that's a reality that a lot of the campuses have to address if they are going to deal with student housing and deal with housing for Indigenous students is what are you going to do with all of the single moms and the broader definition of family um, in terms of people that may be coming with them to support the children that they're bringing with them. It may be mom, it may be sister, it may be a dad, it may be a grandpa, something like that in terms of helping to support the kids as well as helping to support that family. How far away are they coming? How often do they need housing? Do they live close enough that they only really need housing three days a week? Um, and then can you set up something that financially makes more sense for that? But dealing with that broader definition of family and the two different types of students that tend to come. Um, the traditional housing needs too, not just the setting up housing that, that works for them, but as it says uh, down in the key actions there, communicating with the band councils. This was something that was very eye-opening when I was working at Trent. We had a lot of Indigenous students there relative to most institutions in Ontario. The um, First People's House of Learning was going up while I was there. How do we get students to actually live on campus? Because traditionally they had been given 
one pot of money. And this pot of money from the band council covers tuition, housing, and food. Well, tuition is a fixed cost. You can't do anything about that. But housing and food, you can do something about. So if the housing and food, you if you don't apply it to what living on campus costs, then you're basically incentivizing the students to find the cheapest possible place to live and the cheapest possible way to feed themselves, which is the opposite of what you want them to do if you want them to get integrated into the campus, connected with the elders and the other supports on campus, as well as the campus itself and the other students. So we did a lot of negotiations and discussions with the band council about for first year students, can we make it two pots of money? And that second pot of money is, is designated and specifically tied to how much it costs to live on campus so that they're not disincentivized from living on campus, they're incentivized to live on campus because that's where the band wants them to live, to get connected with the campus and be a part of everything. And that's also where the university would like to bring them in because then we can connect them, like Jeff mentioned, to all the supports. Um, Algonquin College, as a for instance, they're certainly not the only ones that do this, but the students self-identify as indigenous as they come in and working in collaboration with the housing office, the admissions office, the indigenous services, as well as the other supports, they make specific contacts with those students to let them know about all the services. And this is done under the table is describing it kind of in a shady way, but it's not done in like in, in the middle of a floor meeting. It's like, oh, Joey, you're indigenous. Here's all these services we've got for you. It's not done like that because they don't want to be drawn out because they may not even want to identify to everybody else yet. But it's done in a private one-on-one -on -one session with, with whether it's the RA or the hall director, just say, hey, I just wanted you to know we have all of these services, we have these connections, we've got these people that are here for you. Here's some connection points. Um, we've set up a small meeting with, with some other folks. You can even do specific housing assignments, not necessarily to ghettoize students in one specific area, but just to keep them not too far away from each other, especially when you don't have big numbers, so that they can help start to make those connections and asking them if they'd like to be identified to some of the other indigenous students so that they can start to make a connection. Um, the um, Examining the rules related to housing, both family housing as well as traditional housing. If you don't have a smudging policy or some other kind of ceremony, ceremony policy for your campus housing, that's something that needs to be created in conjunction with indigenous services, the elders that are there, the students that are there. Because if your smudging policy as a, for instance, is convenient for you, but not for the students, then it's not much of a policy. And that can be difficult to do with with existing housing, because you've got to do some retrofits on some alarm systems. But if anything is new, you can easily set that up from the start um, and have designated spaces that can work for those. But also, if you can make it work for the room, it really isn't that difficult to do. You can adjust the, the systems and then pre-assign the students um, to rooms that can work for that. And the students, if it's a non-Indigenous student that's assigned to that room, they don't need to know that that room is capable of having system shutoffs and things like that. So you can do smudging and then it resets itself, all that to make it more convenient for the students. But making ceremony a part of it in the design of housing or the retrofitting, making community gardens, making uh, indigenous plants, meditation spaces, using indigenous architects with backgrounds in those areas, con communicating with the elders and the communities that your students are representing to get them connected. And also keeping in mind that all of those things help all of your students which is one thing that a lot of times gets forgotten. It's not like you're doing all of these things for just your indigenous students. You are doing it for them, but you're also doing it for everybody. Because if you've got a place that is more welcoming, is better connected with the rest of the campus services, that flows through to everyone. And it can make those students feel much more welcome, whether they're coming with family or whether they're coming in a more traditional setting. Um, but that is one of the biggest things of, are you, are you making it good for them, but also in the process of doing that, you're making it better for everybody. Just to build on a couple of points that, that Mike raised, you know, the, the sort of integration into, into campus and wanting to feel part and feel at home uh, is something that we've heard and, you know, quite, quite a lot. And so, although we have the First Nations Center, uh, which people would assume then because it's the First Nations Center is for Indigenous students, it's actually not. We have many students and it's open to everybody and the Indigenous students actually welcome that and they, they want students to come there because they want to feel as I said, not as you said, just sidelined. You're the you're an indigenous student or anything. Uh, those types of things. So really, again, feeling like a home and feeling part of a, a community, even though they're coming from their their own communities. I think it is really important. The other thing that that's critical in this, you know, and and we're you know 
where government plays a role is how, how do we look for funding to ensure, to ensure that we can work with government and work with the university in order to, to have funding available so we can do uh, the changes that uh, and retrofits or new buildings uh, as, as Mike has outlined. And, you know, using uh, UNDRIP and the, the, the truth, uh, truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations to ensure that we are moving forward. And as I said, it, it is truly aspirational because uh, we'll, never, we'll, we'll never finish, but it, it's something. And as I said during my remarks, uh, when we're doing focus groups and surveys and listening to our students, they do feel they see that we are trying uh, and uh, we don't always get it right. Uh, my classic line is we know 100% of what we think we know. Um, so that uh, ears wide open is, is really important. And uh, and so, um, yeah, so as the points that, that Mike has raised in terms of the built space and, and integrating and then the supports and, and trying to make that as seamless as possible um, as our indigenous community population continues to rise. Um, the other point that Mike raised as well is it's still self-identification in terms of uh, that some people do not want to be identified, some people don't have band funding. So trying to be as flexible as we're building out. Uh, at UMBC, we need to, to look at different housing options. As I said, we are a, a traditional undergrad structure, even though we, we, we are a research intensive university with many master's programs. We have lots of families uh, attending our school, but our current residence is, is that quad structure. So we need to continue to work on that and take opportunities to build on that. One thing I wanted to mention, um, this comes up in a lot, um, well, too many for my taste. Um, when we do the campus visits, uh, as part of the studies to get feedback from students. Um, it's part of the survey and the demand study and all that to goes into helping to plan future housing and see if there's needs for it and all that. There are a lot of campuses where we have to, and keep in mind, we're usually talking to the people that are probably about as open and accepting as anybody else there is on the campus. We're mostly dealing with the student affairs people or they're at least connected to the student affairs people and housing folks. It is not uncommon at all for us to have to ask specifically to speak with a focus group of Indigenous students and the Indigenous service providers on campus, um, Indigenous service offices, the elders on campus, something like that to bring that group together. And a lot of time the answer I, I get when I bring that up is like, you know, this, this was in our suggested list of folks to talk to and I, I don't see that on the schedule we've got built. Um, how can we make that happen? They say, well, we, we house very few Indigenous students on campus. And it, stuns me how many times I've had to say this, but exactly. That's why we need to talk to them. There's a reason they're probably not living there. Um, there's reasons that are in the that are barriers in the way. And sometimes it's not just money. Often money is a part of it. Money is a barrier to living on campus for just about anybody to some degree. It can be a struggle. But um, it, it's some of it is just basically setting it up from the very beginning that consideration for the indigenous students and the different needs that they have is just as important as consideration for the international students and how your populations may be changing there or your domestic students and how those populations may be changing there and just making that a regular part of the discussion and part of the research. Um, very similar to what Jeff is talking about, what they do at, at UNBC. Um, you'd be surprised how many times that has that comes up, even at campuses that have relatively significant populations of Indigenous students on the campus. Yeah, and then I, another point that uh, and just building on that, that's really important in terms of that, you know, you know, why are students not living there and trying to, to move, um, move that in, in a more positive direction. And although this is not necessarily a, a specific housing comment, what I, it speaks to the home component is we need to think about when we're building housing for students that many people visit our campuses to visit our students, in particular indigenous uh, uh, family members and come from communities. So we've we've actually uh, built some space to invite elders onto campus to be with our indigenous students as well. So that that is important. So although, as I say, we're talking about housing, it's the integration of all of that really, really makes an, an important sort of step forward. And, you know, in, in making our campuses is welcome, so. I can tell you a lot of the campuses that will have guest rooms on campus for people to come and visit, usually family members or something like that, they are very much disproportionately used by family members of indigenous students to come down and have a place to stay. Usually at a discount, those, you know, those guest rooms during the academic year aren't really designed to be as a moneymaker. They're more there for a service. The summertime's a little different. 
um, but those are very much disproportionately used by family members of indigenous students who have to tra travel quite a ways and oftentimes don't have the, the funding to stay in the hotels or they're in a very small college community and there aren't hotels or very few of them for them to be able to visit. No, absolutely. So maybe we'll throw it out and see if there's some questions for, for, for Mike and I. And don't all speak it with their... Yeah, the discussions around, is, the questions around uh, working with the band councils and setting up different funding structures and as well as some of the other outreach. Um, the, working with the band councils came out of just confusion of when we looked at our housing records when I first got to Trent of why we don't have very many Indigenous students when we have, A, we have this big fancy building coming soon, but we've, that PhD program had been there for a while and Indigenous services and indigeneity of that campus had been an important part since its inception. Um, and that was when we started working with the elders on the campus and indigenous services on the campus and started to uncover some of the reasons. This happens so much at so many campuses. Um, the deadlines for funding are different at a lot of, the campuses themselves, the deadlines for application fees and deposits and everything else are relatively similar from province to province. But the funding structures for the band councils and when their funds are available don't always match up to those deadlines. So that was one issue. With some of the bands, it was as simple as, you know, hey, we know that we've got 30 students from your band that you've sent here over time, you know, across the, the four or five years of university. How come so few of them have lived in have lived in campus housing? And talking with the students as well as making connections with the actual elders and in a few places doing road trips and going out and talking in person about how can we make this easier? Is there something at our end that's in the way of this? And so there were a number of them where it was just purely deadlines. It's like, we, our funding comes through here. You need your funding here, so you're full. And we don't have any space. So that was a combination of solutions of uh, figuring out how many spaces make sense to hold back for those band councils that couldn't adjust their times. And then also, so we held those spaces back and we extended their deadlines. Um, and that took a little bit of play each year to figure out what's the right number of spaces to hold and what's the reliable number of bodies we that will actually show up. But the, the biggest one was getting it from to be one pot of money to two pots of money so that that money could be dedicated to the different cost of living on campus. It typically is more expensive to live on campus, especially when there's a full meal plan relative to finding to going out of your way to find the cheap stuff off campus because you can always find an overcrowded house to crash in. Um, and we did have students who were couch surfing for most of their academic career, which is a horrible way to get through school, but you do what you got to do. But for at least first year, we wanted them to get connected. So creating the two pots so that if the student wanted to get two pots and wanted to get band funding to come to campus, we'd work around the schedule and the application deadline and figure that part out. But then the band council was willing to dedicate, it's like, okay, you tell us how much housing costs, we will set up one pot of money specifically for housing and food and then we'll work directly with you to get them the money at the time that makes sense. And then the other pot is strictly for tuition and that money doesn't change. It did involve a lot of relationship building. Um, it did put a lot of miles on the car to actually go out to the, the folks and visit them, but it mattered to them that we were willing to, to come out. It wasn't just me, there was other folks on campus to come out and say, how can we make this work? What is the problems? What are the barriers that we've got set up that we don't even know we have set up? So that was a lot of it. A lot of talking, a lot of listening, a lot of explaining things. Um, working with the elders on campus, the elders in the community, and then also recognizing some of the barriers weren't just funding um, and deadlines. Some of the barriers were just flat out, not at Trent so much, but in some of the colleges in the north of BC and then the north of um, uh, Manitoba at University College of the North. They had a lot of students who had zero technology access to be able to process things. So applications still had to be done on paper and figuring out ways to make their applications easier through whether it was admissions tours and setting things up so that they had a way to do submissions um, when the campus was actually on the tours. The campuses would, would bring things and create hotspots so that the students could do their application processes through it. Um, in one case, a campus had to buy a fax machine because that was the one piece of technology that some of the bands had that they could send in the applications and the campus had stopped having a fax machine for 10 years at least. <laughs> 
So they had to go and get a fax machine because that was one way that they could get their applications in. And that was the barrier, that there was a technology barrier from here to there and keeping the applications on paper for some areas. Those are some of the simpler things, but the basic concept behind all of it is talking and listening and communicating and finding out if you've got barriers that are in the way that you don't even know are in the way. Yeah, just building upon Mike's point about, you know, talking, listening, building that relationship. One of the things that we did at UMBC to sort of reduce uh, what we heard was a potential barrier and it, it was started before I came on as president and it's continued now is uh, the main, uh, the, the largest sort of First Nation community of which the Prince George campus is located on, Clayton Tanay. Um, we built an MOU and a, and a process where any potential student from Clayton Tanay First Nation that wanted to come to UNBC, no tuition. So that, that was taken care of. And so that then, you know, the terms of the pots of funding that, that Mike mentioned is, is now focused on housing or other things. Um, and so we work with them on what, what, what they were looking for. What has come out of that is, as I said, there are a number of First Nations communities which UNBC works with. Uh, they've reached out and said, we would like something similar, but we don't, they, we have different needs. And so now we're working to say, okay, we can do that, but not this, or we'll, you know, that, and so really building that relationship to really, as I said, not one approach fits all and really being flexible uh, on that is, is really critical. On the connectivity point, uh, COVID really highlighted this for us. and because we, we have such small communities where, where our Indigenous students are, are from. And uh, when, when COVID hit and we sent students home, we, we quickly saw students come back to campus and we would be like, why are you back on campus? No Wi-Fi in my home community. And so, you know, that, that from a learning perspective during COVID, but to Mike's perspective in terms of applying for things and everything like that, if you can't access, uh, it makes it really challenging. So trying to reduce those barriers. I don't know where one would find a fax machine today. It's <laughs> going to be like a very interesting process to track one down. So yeah, great question. Thanks. Other questions? In the back, please. You're going to have to scream because we don't have a mic for you. Ooh, government asked what we would like. <laughs> Take the. It's a great question. I mean, so the prioritization is something we built, and you're right. I mean, what you're hearing from Mike and I are very unique to our institutions, but some of the broader things like relationship building, I think, can go across and, and listening to students. The prioritization was something done because we don't have Indigenous housing uh, solely for Indigenous students at UNBC, so we had to make sure that we would we find a way to, to address that. I think if I could wave my magic wand and, and say, how can we work with government better? I think one is around flexible funding opportunities so we can A, uh, retrofit or do things within our existing infrastructure to support our indigenous students. Second would be, and you know, we heard uh, Kevin Hall from the University of Victoria earlier in terms of different ways of looking at funding structures in order for us to build uh, new, uh, new sort of housing within our campuses uh, and not just, and I'll just speak for you, NBC in this perspective, not just at Prince George, but our other campuses, uh, whether that's private public partnerships or things along those. So it's a little bit more flexibility. I also think, you know, we need to think outside the box. So I don't quite know what that outside the box is, but I think one of the things that always we get struck with is, well, that's not the way we do it, or that's not the way that the funding structure is built, or that's not the way the process is built. So I think if we are really going to 
really support our indigenous students and you know the communities in which they come from not only across British Columbia in the case of, of working with you but across the country we need to think outside the box and listen maybe not ask us as well ask also indigenous communities what they think would work because as you know the line I used earlier is we know 100 percent of what we think we know and so I think opening up those dialogues and and, and being solution driven and, and trying things I think would would really go a long way a, a few things I would add um my specific campus experience with this is a lot of it is focused on Trent. And so I learned a lot of things there, but then it's been taking a lot of those principles that I picked up at Trent and then applying them to all of the different situations. Um, as a, for instance, University College of the North had far different issues in terms of working with indigenous nations around them that they were serving than Coast Mountain College did up in uh, Northern BC or North Island College on the island. Um, Cause there are very different settings, different nations that they're working with uh, different band councils and policies and things like that. But the general principle starts with communication and listening and really getting down in the deep depths of what, what are barriers, what's in the way. Some of the most basic things, if you're asking me what a government can do, it's less about do and it's a little bit more about facilitate uh, and support. Um, any new construction, it's not that difficult to build in some things that are related to indigenization of housing. And again, like I mentioned before, that's not just for the indigenous students, that's for everybody. And that very much fits into the, the TRC calls to action is helping everybody learn more and understand more and relate more. And most of that stuff is very much dovetails directly with a lot of student affairs missions around mental health and well-being, um, a more holistic view of life, things like that. So that part's the relatively simple part. Retrofitting older buildings is a little bit more difficult, but. Um, recognizing that family housing in general, which is the kind of housing that needs to serve a good chunk of indigenous students, doesn't make money. So somewhere between the campus and the government, um, if you're gonna prioritize indigenous students, there has to be some consideration and discussion of how can that get subsidized because you can't do family housing on a pay by the bed basis if there's one student with three other people and maybe two of the three other people are under 10. You know, they don't have a job that's going to contribute to that. So family housing almost always at campuses gets subsidized in some way, shape or form. And that can be something that between the government and the institutions, they can work together on to figure out what makes sense as a way to subsidize and, pr and prioritize. In terms of prioritizing space, that takes a little bit of time and takes a little bit of work and gets into the communication to figure out if we actually had the housing, how much housing do we need for indigenous students? Um, depending on where they're coming from, depending on what their status is as they're coming in, are they coming in as relatively traditional age or are they coming in with family regardless of what age is and what their needs are for the actual housing physical need? And doing a lot of tracking, a lot of discussion, how many students would be coming if we had it available? And then basically, uh, I, this is a very general rule, you, this would be different from campus to campus, but sort of slowly escalating the number of spaces that get held each year. Um, empty beds are the, the bane of existence for any housing operator. So you, you don't want to hold so many beds that you end up with empty beds come, come fall, but starting off with a certain amount of beds that you hold so that you're dealing, you've dealt with all the barriers, you've done the, uh, the student life designs, all the integrations, all the supports, you figured out whatever subsidies and price points need to happen for those students and then hold a certain amount of spaces and see if they fill. And then maybe the next summer or the, for the next application season, you hold a little bit more if it seemed like you hit those caps and slowly start working like that. But that takes some research and takes some time. And the biggest part is the communication. But from the government end, the biggest obstacle is usually the funding, especially around family housing. The funding for individual students can usually be taken care of through a combination of loans and grants and band funding and maybe scholarships on the campus. But the family ones are the toughest ones because you, Family housing in general is usually subsidized. So that's probably the biggest one is figuring out the family housing and what kind of subsidies can make sense. Does that become an entire provincial effort where a bunch of campuses are working together on something like that? Is that a focus on, you know, as if for instance, and I hope Andrew doesn't shoot me for using this as, as an example. If UBC added $10 to every student that was in first year, and then that $10 was added up and put into a pot that could be used to subsidize indigenous family housing as a, for instance, um, there's enough scale at, at campuses that are that size that that could actually make a difference. 
and there are, it's not unusual. It doesn't happen a lot, but it's there are examples of campuses that have added a fee to be able to support others. Um, sometimes those are, have to be done through referendum because it's done as a student fee. Depends on what province you're in and what those regulations are. But those would be some ideas. Oh, great points, Mike. The other thing I say, you know, is around collaboration. Um, you know, in in Northern BC, there's there's us at the universities. There's also the three colleges. So government could support, you know, and incentivize collaboration on on Indigenous housing, family housing, those type of things. We could we could share that so we don't all have to replicate everything in in each location um i think that will go a long way because at the end benefit of that would be the students and their families that are attending post-secondary whether it's at umbc i see my colleagues from college of new caledonia here coast mountain college in, in terrace as well as northern lights college in Fort St. John and Dawson Creek. So we've begun those conversations as university presidents, but I think having government sort of support that collaboration from an infrastructure investment perspective uh, will go a long way. And no, as to Mike's point, that things like, you know, as we redefine, you know, housing and the, the return on the investment, there's some areas that there is no return on that investment and that's okay. Uh, there's, a, there's, a greater, there's a greater reason for to do what we do, so. Other questions? I don't know where we are for time. <laughs> I've run a bunch. We're over time. We're over time. <laughs> oh, go ahead though. No, 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 no. I don't see Brian. No, so okay. go ahead. Nobody Ask your... told us to shut up yet. So you can say. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll hit this one first, and then J Jeff can add anything he wants to. Personal preference, as someone who's worked in housing since I was an RA at Western, I, I don't like to segregate any individual population. It isn't just Indigenous students. Um, as a for instance, we had an international house at Trent University that was intentionally designed to be we wanted to get 40% international students, 40% domestic students, and we didn't care about the other 20% because we had a critical mass of both. And then they had specialized programming to, to kind of to learn more about the world and their place in it. And we purposely put domestic students that wanted that kind of experience. Um, Western has experimented with that kind of a setup around indigenous ways of learning and knowing to try to get a critical mass of each, the indigenous students and domestic students or international students that were both interested in it. Um, I, I think it's really easy to get students to be isolated and separated from folks. Um, and so working them into the community, but also like what you said with design, especially when you're talking about new, put indigenous design and indigenization into everything because it helps everyone um, and helps support those, those students that are, that are indigenous and work with the bands and the elders to make sure that you're doing the stuff that makes sense for the culture you're dealing with. But there are some campuses where the indigenous population is the population that needs housing and not too many other people are are not indigenous. So you're going to by default have um, communities that are largely indigenous uh, all living together because there aren't that many other people at the campus. So in that case, obviously there are gonna be a little bit more separated, but personal preference is, is finding a critical mass of each and trying to bring people together and help them learn um, and setting up the building in a way that's gonna support that as well. Yeah, quickly, I'll just, I agree wholeheartedly with Mike in terms of that. And there's ways to be intentional in terms of, you know, in intersection points and bringing people together. And then there's points where they, they, they would be more segregated, is not the word, but they would have a more of a an indigenous focus base. But from what we've heard, and I'm now looking at Lisa Hazlitt, my director of, of business services, who housing is in her portfolio. You would say, Lisa, that students don't want to be; they want to be integrated and be part of the university community. And so and she's nodding to that. The other thing we could do is is expand the definition of housing into what I what Mike and I have said in terms of that home and the university is a home. So making sure that the indigenization of your campus, so it doesn't just 
you know, housing isn't just indigenized and then you go into main campus and it isn't. We, we need to make sure that, that that home theme goes across our campus. And so we're not only, and we're supporting our indigenous students, but we're also show highlighting and, and allowing our non-indigenous students to be part of that as well. And that's where transformational change will occur if, if everybody in the community, uh, the university community at large is, is living that. So appreciate the support from government as we continue to, to navigate this, so. One, one last thing I'll add, um, and this is relative to a, a resource that, that you're all welcome to use. Um, if you go to the scionadvisory.com, there's a link on there that, to an article that I wrote about Indigenous student housing in, in Canada. But I mean, sure, read what I wrote. I think it's good. But the biggest thing about it, it, it was done in a journal for an international student housing um, thing that was a special issue on Indigenous student housing around the world. Um, including a lot of special programs, special activities they've done. Some of it is housing design, but a lot more of it is the actual community building and how they've done outreach with elders in other communities. So there's articles in there from literally all around the world. Um, and some of the, the things from New Zealand and Australia around um, bringing Maori, Maori, geez, Maori culture into the buildings um, and Aboriginal culture uh, in Australia and some other places as well. So there's that whole issue is all around indigenous student housing around the world and different ways it's it's been improved and uh, brought support to, including some government programs too. Great. Well, as as Mike said, we're over time. Appreciate the questions. I say extremely important topic that we could continue to have. Mike and I will be around for a little bit if folks want to run up and have a chat with us. I don't know where Brian is, uh, but uh, if you've got your program, open to the next section. See where you're supposed to be. <laughs> and if you're speaking, you're late. Uh, <laughs> and uh, again, thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, in about one minute or two, we'll be talking about affordability in student housing. I will be talking about affordability. <laughs>